Hello and welcome. I'm Father Methodius, priest and rector of the Birth of the Baptist Church in Pinckney, Michigan. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Prasforka. I hope this small offering will sustain and give you strength to live a life of piety and purity. In the previous episode of our study of the famous book, The Path to Salvation, we learned what every Orthodox Christian should know. Because Orthodoxy is essentially ascetical, we conclude that every truly Orthodox Christian is an ascetic. The fundamental truth we learned is that Orthodox ascetics should focus all their energy on inner concentration and guarding of the heart. According to our teacher, St. Theophon the Recluse, this process is summarized by the word soberness, the science of sciences. This brings us to the point where, if we have been paying attention, we can confidently say that we understand why all ascetics considered soberness to be the chief of all the ascetic virtues, and why he who does not have it is considered fruitless. In this episode, as we begin chapter 8, the beginning of ascent towards living communion with God, we will take the same point and apply it to our heavenward ascent. For this is our goal, while all external work is the means. In my desire to constantly emphasize the pragmatic nature of our holy orthodoxy, I have pressed the importance of attaching the right goals, or goal, to our pursuits. If we understand our goal, we can better understand the methods we use, their value, and we can even use them more effectively. The more we practice, the better suited we will be to endure sorrows and unpleasant situations prepared for us by our loving God. When it comes to our ascent towards communion with God, the saint says, we must show the essential pull of the ascetically laboring spirit towards God, the conditions for quickly coming nearer to him, and the state of one who has become near, or better to say, of one who is capable of this, for nearness itself comes from God. The Beginning of Ascent Towards Living Communion with God Before I begin this section, I want to point out the obvious. Today's so-called convert is someone who has made a rational decision to embrace something they call orthodoxy. You can find them all over the internet, dogmatizing as they lecture about all the reasons they chose orthodoxy. Because most of the examples I see come from world orthodoxy, I am not surprised by the amount of mistakes they make, both in the way they present orthodoxy and in their presentation of orthodox teachings and standards. Today's converts have little in common with the convert we have come to understand through this series, the one who has come to his senses and spends his time fanning into flame the awakenings of grace in the heart. When St. Theophon says convert, he has the second example in mind, not the first. And a convert can be anyone who wakes up to his need of salvation, even someone who has lived most of his life in the church. Having confirmed himself inwardly, says our teacher, the convert directs all the strength of his zeal towards the business of correcting himself from impurity and passions, to the freeing of his powers and strengthening them in God-pleasing activities. This work swallows all of his attention, labors, and time. If this is the case, and it is, the convert has no time to make videos about why she chose orthodoxy. While many today become overnight equals to the apostles online, the true convert, according to the extent to which he has accustomed himself to this activity, as well as the ordering and organization of his inward state, will naturally go more and more within himself, concentrating within and placing a beginning of unceasing inner concentration. And, just because we are prone to associate this kind of rigor and inner experience to advanced stages of asceticism, the recluse says, 
This is the goal of primary asceticism, entering within oneself. For many, and I fall into this category occasionally, we lose sight of the goal and get derailed by the cares of life. For others, the cares of life lead to captivity and estrangement from spiritual things. The pews of Orthodox churches usually fill with these souls on Sunday, and that, after the epistle and gospel lessons have been read, the preaching concluded, and everything thought to be threatening to the conscience is safely put away. The church is the place where passions are battled with, although, as we have learned, unless they are battled against, the battle is already lost. But according to our measure of estrangement from the realm of the passions, says the recluse, that goal naturally appears as the main striving and longing of our spirit, and all labor is undertaken in order to widen its circle. The sad thing is that many Orthodox Christians never enter that circle at all. For them, Orthodoxy is like other religions. They fail to use the methods provided, and they remain outside the circle, outside of themselves. What then does it feel or look like when man gets serious and begins the ascetical labor? Vladika says, At first man is covered with fear. He serves like a slave. Out of a duty and obligation he became aware of at the moment of his awakening. Then the fear subsides, and without disappearing gives way to the sweetness of labor for the Lord and of a pleasant feeling connected with it. This is the beginning of the soul's coming alive to God, the ripening of its bright goal. I have seen this change take place, on one level, when people who force themselves to come to the services like the vigil service, struggling for months or years, until one day something changes, and they tell me, after a nearly five-hour service, that it seemed so quick. Of course, this is not an automatic indication, but coupled with other changes, as a spiritual guide, I have seen some people make progress from slavishly and dutifully practicing their faith to discovering why the Holy Fathers can say, Prayer is rest. Thus, the foregoing ascetic labors can cultivate a yearning for God, but they need to be directed to that particular inner disposition that should be preserved during the labors themselves. If we forget the goal, we can suffer from despondency or what is sometimes called burnout. But if we keep the goal in mind, our labors will serve that goal and help us to participate in it. Section 1. Ascent to God there are three things to remember if one wishes to preserve the inner state of longing for God or the mind's assent to Him. First, you may have heard of the Christian virtue called remembrance of God. The mind should be accustomed to living in the presence of God, for He is near, and, says Ladika, let Him ascend to the feeling that He is seen by God. This practice is the doorway to God the opening of heaven to the mind. Second, everything should be done for the glory of God. This is an easy one to get wrong. The only example necessary to show how wrong we get this is that of the Republican National Convention, which sees itself as the manifest presence of God. What God, though? Everything should have as its motive, both inwardly and outwardly, the glorification of the all-holy trinity. And third, whatever you do, force yourself to see that God wants this work from you. Receive whatever you come across as from the hand of the Lord, an individual, a thing, an incident, joy, sorrow. Everything should be received with joy, submitting yourself eagerly, peacefully, delightfully, regardless of its distastefulness.
Notice this is not the same as thinking that whatever I do must be the will of God. If this were the case, and if it was supposed that I believed myself to be, and everyone else believed himself to be doing the will of God, there would be no chance that anyone would repent ever, nor would they feel compelled to do so. The best way to implement this third activity is to trust in the providence of God, study all his commandments, and seek to do his holy will. This all takes time and energy. It may be that you hear this and think, I will try sometime. How can I sweeten the deal for you? How can I convince you that spending your time in other pursuits is a waste of your time? That is, what do you get, or how does living this way make your life better? He who has spiritual ears, let him hear. The recluse says, By these spiritual activities, the mind will see God more and more clearly and confirm itself in the vision of God. You will become accustomed to mentally standing in the vision of God with his infinite perfections. Is it hard for you to keep a prayer rule daily? Do you push yourself to pray outside of pravila, as the daily rule is called? Do you complain about how long you have to stand during church services? Are you only able to pay attention to the services because you need to know when the next time is you may sit? You should know that the aforementioned sight or vision of God is given for the most part during prayerful times of standing in the presence and that it is the very beginning of ascent to living communion with God. Do you think that I'm stretching things to invoke church services in a parish or prayers at home? Do you suppose that this divine visitation only happens in hermit's caves or on mountaintops? How many stories there are in the lives of the saints— how many icons depict the experience people have who are visited by God during common prayer or prayer at home? Many. We should pray at church or at home with expectant hearts. Concurrently with the vision of God is manifested and perfected a reverent worship of God in spirit. When the spirit falls down before him, painfully crying out to him in self-abnegation as his creature, not, however, in pain that he has been flouted and turned away, but with the awareness that God has accepted him, had mercy on him, and been gracious unto him. This will result in an irrepressible inward pull and rapture to God. Notes from a Parish Priest when I visit your churches either to celebrate or to concelebrate, and you come to the service after the catechumens have been dismissed, or when if a bishop is in attendance and my catechumens are scandalized because of how many people show up at the very end of the service, I want you to know I do not immediately reason that the tardiness of all these latecomers was caused by the fact that they were caught up in ecstasy, experiencing divine vision with such fervor that they lost any connection with time. You might muster the courage to ask, well, what do you think, Father Methodius? I'm going with cares of life, lack of reverence for holy things, distraction, these sorts of things. I know, I'm probably wrong. If this describes any of you, and your disordered life is the result of theoria, I would be very interested to hear about it. Maybe you could leave a comment or make a podcast about how you achieved the vision of God apart from the methods used by all the saints. The God-approved bishop says, Yearning for God is the goal. But at first, it is only in intention, sought for. It should be made real, alive, like a natural pull that is sweet, earnest, and uncontrollable. Only this kind of pull can show that we are in our place, that God accepts us, that we are going to Him. I know I was a little facetious just now, but I'm trying to wake people up. Many people say they love God, 
but do not have any time for prayer, church services, or for govinya. They say one thing, but by their decisions and actions, it is shown to be simply lip service. They may be religious people, but they do not long for God. The fact is that when iron is drawn to a magnet, it means that magnetic power has touched it. It is the same in the spiritual realm. It is only apparent, says the saint, that God is touching us when there is this living attraction, when the Spirit disdains all and reaches for God and is exalted in God. We must remember that it is God who plants the seed in us. It does no good to say that one has love for God unless the soul begins to turn away from everything as from the cold and draws toward God who warms it. What is the sign that a seed of grace has been planted and is being ripened? Vladika says, Earnest, quiet, and unforced inner concentration before God, accompanied by a feeling of reverence, fear, joy, and the like, before the Spirit had to push itself within, and now it is established and stands there without leaving. Again, let's make this practical. Are you happy to pray in the morning and evening? Do you plan your life so that you can attend as many church services as possible? Or do you go to church if you can occasionally? These are not unimportant questions, and I'm not picking on people. The difference between the answers you give to these questions will indicate the quality or amount of light in your soul. If you resent the length of the liturgy, if you find it always necessary to shorten your rule of prayer, it may be that you do not love God as you suppose. If you did, you would be happy to be there alone with God, away from all others, without paying attention to what goes on outside of yourself. Whether monk or layperson, you would be a hesychast. Such an immersion in oneself or immersion in God is called mental silence or being taken up to God. This may come and go, but it should be made a permanent state, for it is the goal. St. Theophan the Recluse has now, in no uncertain terms, stated what you may have been anticipating for some time. He has said that the goal of Christian orthodoxy is Hezekia. That means that all Orthodox Christians, those called to live ascetic lives, are also called to become enraptured in spirit by coming into contact with the living God. Vladika says, Thus does the yearning for God, or joining with God, begin to ripen and perfect itself through divine grace within anyone who seeks God sincerely, fervently, and in good conscience. And the essential condition for this is the purification of the heart so that it can accept God who draws it to himself. The pure in heart shall see God. How does obedience play into this experience? Is it necessary for most people to be in obedience, or is this simply an option for those on the fast track? Our teacher says, the condition for this indwelling and reigning of God in us, or the acceptance of his acting in everything, is the renunciation of our own freedom. As a parish priest, I receive questions about this all the time. What if what I want to do is good, is often asked. A free creature, says the recluse, according to his consciousness and determination, acts from his own self. But this should not be so. He supports this fact by showing that deference and submission are the characteristics of life in the church. He says, In the kingdom of God, there should not be anyone acting from himself. God should be acting in everything. 
This cannot happen, he says, as long as freedom stands for itself. It denies and turns away God's power. And this stubborn resistance to God's power will only cease when our free or self-acting individual will and activity fall down before him. When we pronounce the resolute prayer, Do thou, O Lord, do in me as thou wilt, for I am blind and weak. Self-will strips man's spirit of power. The reason for this is that man was created to move towards God, and man's spirit is the energy that motivates this movement. To move away from God is unnatural to the spirit of man, and in working this way, its energy is depleted. Obedience corrects the movement of the spirit, though, allowing it to operate according to its original design. In this moment, says the recluse, the power of God enters the spirit of a man and begins its all-encompassing work. Thus, the condition for communion with God in us is the decisive dedication of ourselves to Him. I fear that beginners, newcomers to the Orthodox Church, are prevented from learning these things, or at least they are left to learn about them on their own because the priest is too busy organizing bake sales and festivals. The one who has been properly prepared, though, will have a disposition beneficial to learning good spiritual habits. Vladika says, The beginner wants to labor for the Lord's sake, to serve Him, and he labors. By this, he develops a good hope, and as it were, a boldness to behold God. As I said, too often he is left this way without anyone to teach him or lead him into the next phase. Vladika says, but it obviously should not remain this way. He must be guided without slackening this same zeal. He must submit himself to God, hearken to his call, and accustom himself to following his suggestions and attractions. It would be a great joy for the parish priest if his children made progress in the mystical life. However, it is no credit to him to survive a brutal parish council battle because, as the Apostle says, there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. On the other hand, a priest must be doing something right if it can be said of his parish, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. True Orthodox Christians dedicate themselves and their whole life to Christ God. This dedication is the first noble and beautiful act. He says in his heart, I shall go as one bound whithersoever thou willest. But we must not confuse a formal declaration of dedication for the actual life of dedication. One must tend to this growth and facilitate it, says our teacher, or better, accept what has developed and grown. But man says, I chose, I wanted, I labored, and God helped. Vladika corrects this man-centered mistake by saying that Wanting, choosing, and labors are also good works and therefore godly, but man thinks that his accomplishment comes from his own power, born of his efforts and exertion. Thus, the inner ascent from zeal to zealous dedication to God is nothing other than the revelation and appearance to our consciousness of God's work in us. The zealot becomes enlightened about this reality through frequent failures met in spite of all his efforts and unexpected and great successes met without particularly trying. I realize that this episode has moved quickly through some very heavy topics. I mentioned Hezekiah briefly and moved past it quickly. I hope you will join me next time when I discuss section two, 
living communion with God occurs in a state of Hezekiah, which brings passionlessness. But before I conclude, I want to leave you with an exhortation. That exhortation is to see in your current practices a snapshot of your spiritual condition. I talked about how impatient people are at prayer, how they are distracted, and how they do not show reverence for holy things. And I am certainly no saint myself. But what I want to do is to look at my life inside and out and compare it with what I hear or read in the Holy Fathers. When I do this, I quickly realize that I have been negligent and unmotivated. Bodily prayer, or the saying of prayers, as contained in the prayer book, is a discipline. Attending church services on time and paying attention, something we are actually commanded to do at certain times during them, are disciplines we practice or employ that not only get us ready for spiritual experiences, but are themselves spiritual. When we practice these things with faith, God is likely to come to us in those moments. But we want to use our relationship to these bodily public things as a way of taking the temperature of our soul. I leave you with this illustrative quote from our teacher, St. Theophon the Recluse. The field of communion with God, the realm in which it unfolds and grows, is mental, spiritual prayer. One who prays abides in God, and consequently, he is very ready and able for God to begin to abide in him. But this kind of prayer is not the same as just saying prayers. It is a special, spiritual work done only under direction and ripening imperceptibly to the directed as well as to the director. In it, we could say, consists the final stage of the rules of asceticism. For when this prayer comes and confirms itself, God is one with our spirit. The rules relate only to its inception, but what happens in it upon perfection is hidden, rendered invisible, like Moses behind the clouds. Please join me next time. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining me. Please remember to support us by spreading the word about genuine orthodoxy in Michigan. We appreciate also your financial support. To send donations through PayPal, please use fellowheirs at hotmail.com. Check out our website at Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church, no H at the end of church.com. Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church.com. God bless you.